Hello and welcome to today's video. I am Adam Sandoval and today we are going to talk about the Trans America Trail. That is an off-road ride from coast to coast, North Carolina to Oregon. This video will cover not only the things I wish I had known before I took the trail, but also my favorite parts of the trail. And if you stay tuned to the end, we'll tell you about the worst parts of the trail as well. So we're going to start out this conversation with how many miles a day should you expect to ride when it comes to the trail and what is the skill level of the Trans America Trail. First things first, miles a day. So basically this is going to vary east coast to west coast because the difficulty level varies greatly from east coast to west coast. The west coast is much more difficult than the east coast. So when I was on the east coast it was nothing to knock out 200 miles a day. It would have been very easy to do even though a lot of times I didn't because I enjoyed taking my time stopping for picnics, photo ops, video ops, things like that. But I think 200 miles a day is pretty realistic regardless of your skill level. When you get to the west side, it becomes a much different game and that 100 to 150 miles a day seem to be more realistic. If you're a very aggressive rider, I think you could probably do that 200 miles a day without an issue. But if you want to enjoy it, take your time or maybe you're a little less experienced like I was when I took the trail. I was a brand new rider, y'all. I had never done an off-road adventure style trip period before this, uh, then you're probably going to look closer to that 100 range. The next topic that I feel is pretty relevant is the bike selection. You can go anywhere from light motorcycles, your 125 cc's, you know, your 150's, all the way up to the big 1000 cc Africa Twins like I did or even maybe like a 1200 GS. So it comes down to this, how much of the trail are you going to be riding? Are you going to be riding the entire thing or sections? If you're riding sections and you're doing the more difficult sections, which I'll tell you about later here in this video, you're gonna want the lighter bike. You're gonna wanna go with the 250, the 400, something like that. But if you're riding the entire thing or riding these long stretches, you're gonna want the heavier bikes. Me, myself, I chose to ride on a Honda Africa Twin 1000. My girlfriend and some veterans that rode along with me rode on a BMW GS800. And I can tell you on those longer stretch, probably 75% of this trail, I was very thankful that I was on the bigger bike and I could crush those bigger miles without worrying about it. If you've ever had to do 200 miles in a day on something like a 250, heck, I've never done 200 miles on a 250. I've done 100 miles on a 250 and it wasn't a whole lot of fun riding on the roads at 65 miles an hour. That's where the bigger bike comes in. But on those more difficult parts, the 25% of it, I sure wish I would have had that lighter motorcycle. The next topic is hard versus soft bags, and there are advantages to hard and soft bags. We tested both. We brought Moscow Moto soft bags, and we brought the Jesse Luggage hard bags. And while I personally would recommend the soft bags, there are lots of advantages to the hard bags as well. I did an entire video, hard versus soft, and you can click this link right here to see it. I will tell you one thing. If you click that link, you're gonna see where a buddy of mine who's riding with did indeed break his leg on the hard bags. And well, you'll be able to see all about that in the video. Another thing you're really gonna to wanna to think about when it comes to this trip is hotel versus camping. Are you gonna stay at hotels or are you going to camp? Both are able to be done the entire trip. So you can basically do the entire trip staying at hotels as long as you plan your days correctly but you can also do the entire trip camping as long as you plan your days correctly. Obviously, if you're out for a long time, those hotels are nice, the showers, a comfortable bed, air conditioning or heat, depending on the time of the year you're in, there's a lot of advantages to taking those hotels, but there's just something awesome about getting on a bike, getting into nature and camping. So, you know, I did a variety of both. We did some hotel stays and we did a lot of camping. And you know, that choice is yours to make but I'm gonna tell you some equipment you need to bring whether you're on hotels or whether you're camping. So here's my top four things I would bring. I've been riding street bikes for a very long time and flat tires have never been a big concern of mine, but when you're out there and you could be 100 miles from the nearest city and that city may not even have a bike shop, being able to fix your own tires is important. On this trip we had a total of three flat tires and you know we had to get those things fixed. So. I would say uh, number one, probably the most important thing is a spare tire front and rear, a tube if you're running tubed. 
N number two is gonna be a set of tire spoons to be able to break that tire down and change it on the side of the road and get you back. Hydration is gonna be a very important thing because you are gonna be long periods of time away from the city and you know you're gonna to need to be able to get those fluids in you a lot of times out west especially you're in desert suns for hours on end picking up bikes make sure you have plenty of water plenty of hydration packs and then lastly should be pretty obvious to any rider but if you happen to be a new rider proper gear you're gonna be running deserts which are gonna be 100 degree plus depending on the time of the year you're even on those 100 degree days you're gonna be in mountains that are cold and everywhere in between so proper rain gear proper warm weather gear and proper cold weather gear are all gonna be essential to you enjoying your trip safely across this Trans America Trail. Okay y'all, this is probably one of the sections y'all were most excited for and I'm happy to tell you, my favorite parts of the TAT. If I was gonna go out and just do a couple days or a stretch and just want to do one section or the other, or where should you go ride? East versus West becomes the first debate, I think, with a broad brush. The East Coast is very much pavement, not a lot of dirt. It's really more just scenic back roads. And some of those roads even have since it's been made turned into developments. It really wasn't that great for me. For me, it was more like my American V-Twin riding, except uh, you know with the added suspension of these adventure bikes, when the roads were in poor condition, it was enjoyable instead of you know a nightmare like on a Harley Davidson per se. But there were still some good sections on the East Coast. So if you're stuck having to choose a section on the East Coast, my number one pick would be Teleco Plains to Pelham, Tennessee. In my opinion, that is hands down the best part. You're gonna have some fun, some creek crossings, and well, just some difficult challenges. To ride the tack correctly, you should go from East to West. So these will be your first challenges if you're doing the entire tack. Mississippi would probably be my next recommendation. Mississippi had some good dirt roads and it's when we really started to see the dirt. So those are my two favorite parts of the east side of the tap. But now let's talk the west side because it's much different and the difficulty really comes out of nowhere. So probably my favorite for the entire tat was the Engineers Pass area of Colorado. So that's going to be backed by your like your Ure, your Silverton, in that kind of area of Colorado up there in the middle. The thing I loved about that section was is you got major high elevations, steep drop-offs, difficult rocks to ride over, and you know great creek crossings, forests. In my opinion, one of the most beautiful parts of the Trans America Trail, but still very dangerous because any one of those cliffs you fell off would be instant death. So the adrenaline's high and views are amazing and the traction's good. I will say the difficulty level there is probably way up there. As a new off-road rider and a very experienced street rider, I was at the very top of my skill set to be able to tackle these passes. So, you know, those passes in that section of Colorado, probably my favorite part, but I'll share at the end of the video the most difficult, but almost the most difficult at the same time. And if that is the type of riding you're looking for, the following passes right along it are great. Uh, Imogene Pass and of course Black Bear Pass, which I wasn't able to do because the snow was on there, but I think that's supposed to be the most difficult of all those passes. Probably my next favorite section of the TAT, again falls in the west, and that is Moab. Moab was just absolutely amazing. Beautiful views, you know, you just feel like you're on another planet. You're like in Mars and, you know, these roads bring you way back into the middle of nowhere, long long ways from civilization and it was just a lot of fun although the views were great the difficult part was this is where some of the sand started getting introduced to the trip which did make it a little bit more sketchy and difficult i find it even more difficult than the passes that we did in colorado it's hard to keep your bike going especially with the heavy bike and i did find some of that to start in moab but definitely not anything uh, that was overwhelming Immediately following Moab, less than 100 miles later, you're going to be going to one of my other favorite spots of the TAT, and that is Black Dragon Wash. And I had never heard about it before I rode into it, and when I rode into it, it took my breath away. Just the sheer cliffs and riding on the bottom of these valleys, and really from Black Dragon Wash on for the next few hundred miles, really some beautiful, gorgeous riding through some canyons and valleys and just really neat. Again, you're getting some bigger rocks that's gonna be a difficult to get over and get around and you're gonna still have some sand so the difficulty's there, but the scenery is just absolutely out of this world. Probably one of the coolest, uh, most connected moments of the trip for me. 
Okay, and now the absolute worst part of the tat, the most difficult part of the tat for me, became very obvious once I was in the middle of it. It's the desert, man. It was that northern Nevada, southern corner of Utah. That section right there was by far for me the most difficult, especially with the bigger bike. It is again, another one of the few times I wish I would have had a lighter bike. And that was because of the sand. I mean, you were in the middle of the desert. The views were uh, not much. I mean, it was just barren land for as far as you could see. And these roads went forever. It was literally like riding in a bag of sugar. Your tires would just wash out any direction. Uh, I think the worst we had is a guy with me dropped 12 times in one day. And I think it took us like eight hours to go about 60 miles. So for me, that was without doubt the worst part. It was hot, it's hard to walk in sand, it's hard to pick up bikes in sand, it's hard to push bikes in sand, it's hard to ride bikes in sand. That sand was just hands down the most difficult part of the tap for me and really just the part that I would absolutely avoid if I was select riding the tat. I just, that is not something that was enjoyable to me and not something that I would do. So if you are not trying to do the challenge, coast to coast, water to water, let's do the entire Trans-America Trail, make this epic adventure. If you're just trying to get out and have some fun riding and you wanna just pick the good parts, that section there would probably be my number one point to avoid. It was exhausting. That is it for your must know stuff about the Trans-America Trail. It's a lot of fun. Sometimes roads close and your trail, your map will take you somewhere that's no longer an open road. So you gotta make it your own and you gotta be flexible no matter which maps you buy. Me, I went with GPS Kevin maps and I found them to be 90% accurate and good. Uh, maybe I think three times I found roads that were closed or changed that I couldn't go through. So, hey, if you like this video or you like any other videos that we've put out, I will close this out with a few for you to check out. Uh, but please, click that subscribe button, follow along, and if you hit that bell, it'll give you notifications when the next video comes out, so you're sure not to miss any of the content we're producing for you, because we throw five a week at you. That's right, five videos a week, every week on this channel. It's Adam Sandoval, and it's just a little window into my life and the things I love. Motorcycles happens to be a big part of that. We'll see you all later.